It's not a bad looking place up here. We're 880 feet up, out on the hills, up in the northeast. Most days it gets a bit windy and it does help if you like it cold. But this place is a bit special and it's a bit special because of the people who are from here. You see, this community has gone through some very trying times. Times that would be hard on any community. And it's taken this area 30 years to recover. But recover it has. This place is Concert. It's situated about 15 miles southwest of Newcastle and about 20 miles in off the coast. Not that long ago it was a very big steel town. There was about 4,000 employed within the plant and another 4,000 in the community supporting it. It was also an area of coal mining, manufacturing, farming. It even had a hospital that was a regional centre for burns and plastics. But all of that's gone. Its biggest industry though was iron and steel. And when the old Concert Iron Company was nationalised in 1967, it then became under direct control of national government. And when Margaret Thatcher rose to power in 1979, one of the first things she went about doing was, in her words, streamlining British industry. In plain English, that meant the immediate closure of Concert Steelworks. That simple decision that was made in London was the catalyst that would see changes in Concert that were the biggest in over a hundred years. You worked at Concert for many years. When you heard the news of its closure, how did you feel? Somewhat dismayed at first. You know, it was always a thought that Concert had been there for over a hundred years and be there for many, many years to come. It had been a successful plant. It had a successful workforce and they were well motivated. And then when this rocket came from nowhere, that there was going to be such reductions in the steel industry of Britain, which I understand was taken on behalf of the common market, that each independent state would reduce their steel productions. And our government of the day saw fit for the close whatever they wanted. One was Raven's Creek, another one was Corby, third one was Concert. As regarding the thoughts of the guys, there was a lot. There was a lot of silence, a lot of silent thought. You know, you could see it in their faces. There'd be quiet di discussions, uh, mainly, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to feed the family? There's no jobs. I'm going to have to leave home. Many were resigned about it, you know. Others thought, well, I'll just have to do my best, as ha happened in many, many cases. But anyone who was, say, aged 37 or 39, they could say bye-bye to any hope at all of work. Indeed, for many years to follow the closure. How would you like working at the plant? It was brilliant. The only word for it. Shift work, brilliant. You met all, all, all these guys who'd been out the club the day before, or this and that, they'd been on their holiday. There was always a sense of optimism in the workplace. The memories were underlying and they were ever evident. They made a lot of lifelong friends and families because almost everyone in the town lived near someone who worked in the plant. And if you rotated between the plants, as I did for some time, you found and you realised how very close-knit the people who were. In the local working men's clubs, you can call them rough and ready and whatever, but man, you there's some black diamonds among them, like. <laughs> On the last shift, when you tapped the last block of steel, how was the atmosphere? Well, I was 62 on the 12th of September, 1980. And uh, my position is production scheduler. I had to uh, schedule the steel production with availability of hot metal or iron from the blast furnace. And of course on that day they, they opted just to blow, I think it was either one or two blow, I think it was one. And they didn't start until um, quarter to nine, nine o'clock. Uh, 
very quiet. Everybody just doing the job as best they could, tidying up and whatever, getting the raw materials ready. Uh, and they were just quietly resigned to it. There was a lot of uh, of the media there, of course, uh, like myself and others. Some t took the camera in to take a couple of shots. Um, the first blow took pl blow is in the production of the steel. Took place from about ten thirty, and as it was, at the end of bringing iron down. So they're tamping down the blast furnaces even at that stage. And they said, well, we've got about 48 hours to get the plant reopened if we were going to do it. Or get someone to change the mines, whether or not, you know, which is out of the question. Even on the very last day of production, did any of the workers feel that concert might be granted a reprieve? There was a very strong feeling that, yes, we can change their mines. You know, uh, there was a strong... I won't call it anything other than a strong socialist belief in man's right to work. I can fully understand the feelings of people in any one other on the face of this earth that when they're faced with the unsurmountable problems that seem to present themselves because you're going to lose your livelihood through no fault of your own, mm. then it brings some very strange attitudes and um, emotions to the fore. People say that the red dust, it got on everything. Was it really as bad as that? Before 1963, when the LD steel plant opened, the air was clear and pure, as it is now, largely. Because of the predominantly westerly winds, well, the works being built where it was, to the west of Concert, any production of any smoke or otherwise, gradually went over to the east, over concert. Well, the red dust was like a ferrous oxide, like a rust, but it's in uh, dust form, rather than, as you know, do, uh, rust on uh, a piece of steel. And so it was so light, uh, you just lift it up and it would just float away. The air. Now, I understand that, that those red dust particles were found as far as away as uh, Darlington on x-ray plates but we were all assured that it was entirely inert. The temperatures that had produced it were such that no bacteria could, could, could survive it. Uh, I know fellows who worked in it along with it and so on but it didn't make any difference whatsoever to the poor wives of the area who had to uh, take the washing in or even do the washing again. Yeah. You know the way that white cats are, are deaf, don't you? They're totally deaf. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where well, you fancy going out one day white and you come back red, you know. It sounds like you really miss the plant. Oh, I, I do. Well, the, 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 the uh, very idea that uh, you would never know when somebody's going to pull a prank on you, you know, but it was never harmful. It, it was always with this sense of uh, levity. You look forward to going to work to get the jokes from the other shift or whatever else, or where they'd been or what they'd done. There was a good m motivational factor between the management and the ordinary workers. It was that that made the concert workers work. Was there any more bad news for the town? Well, it was all bad news, wasn't it? It was all bad news. There was a sense of anticlimax, and then when it came along, there was this excitement. Oh, I'm going to find another job. I'm going to go here, there, and yonder. You know, they did. But then, when the realization set in that there were no opportunities, or it's unlikely that there would be opportunities, I was fortunate. I went on a business studies course and then to Newcastle Poly. And four years later, I got a job. But within three years, my health suffered, and I had to retire. Having said that, there's, there's many made a, made a successful life af, after the works. But very slowly, the realisation that life wasn't going to get any better, I think the people of Concert are made of such stern stuff that they just knuckled down and they've come out of it great. The steel works are gone. The whole reason for Concert being here is gone. 
From the 1840s, this place grew for one reason only, and that was to be a massive work camp. The living conditions were terrible, and there was a lot of trouble between the locals and the Irish immigrants who would come here in the masses for work. But in 1980, when the steelworks closed, the heartbeat of this town stopped, and only the people were left. People who were left to live in a ghost town. One of the few quotes I've had of positives from that time was that then it wasn't embarrassing to be unemployed. This story does hurt and I wanted to find out why the event of the closure really had to happen. The concert was miles away from the nearest port, which increased production costs. The area had no stocks of its own ore. The last of that ran out years earlier adding to production costs. Many of its rivals had newer plant. Even its local coal ran out. The last coal mine closed in 1980, which added up to making Consett a very tough job to stay open. The steelworks did cause this town to be incredibly polluted. The red dust from the LD plant got literally everywhere. It covered the town. The red dust got into people's clothes, it got into their eyes, it got into their hair. It must have gotten to their chest and it must have caused some quite severe health problems. It also must have had a pretty negative effect for anybody who came into the town from the outside. You know the bosses who made the profits from the vast amount of money the steelworks made never spent any of that money on the town. There's no grand design buildings. There was very little works of art, very little public gardens, not even a town hall. The council didn't seem to take much interest in developing any of those features either. And if the council can't actually develop the town and make it a decent town, why should national government have any interest in keeping it going? Those things all added up to the ceiling of Consett's fate. Do you have optimism for Consett's future? Well, for to be anything other than optimistic, you'd be pessimistic in being pessimistic about anything these days hasn't got any weight. Mm. One day I won't be here as will others and all you can do is to hope that the essence of life as you've known it will continue after you're no longer here and that's the end of the matter. After meeting Tommy Moore it was plain to see that life had to change up here before this town could recover and the lives of everyone in this town had to follow along with the changing times. And that's been happening, though Tommy wasn't exactly boastful of how those changes have happened. But they have. There are signs of these changes all over the town. This walkway I'm walking down now used to be one of the many railways that carried goods from the works. But they've all been dug up and replaced with walkways so we can all enjoy them a sign that the times have changed. Whilst Tommy told me a lot, I was surprised that he didn't try to blame anybody, either then or now, for the great loss that the people had to endure. 36% unemployment, followed by a huge exodus of people getting on their bikes to find work. I know there are many old steel men who feel robbed of their works, as I feel robbed of not being able to see even a tiny glimpse of their plant. Both the steelworks and the railways have completely vanished from the area. It's like the present stop for this town in 1980, and it's taken 30 years to get it going again, only this time in another era. The new do inside college takes root. The bypass replaces the railway. The health centre replaces the train station.